2, Part 3, and Part 4. Now look at Part 1. Part 1. You are going to hear a travel agent discussing a holiday booking with two customers. First, you have some time to look at questions 1 to 3. Now we shall begin. You should answer the questions as you listen, because you will not hear the recording a second time. Listen carefully and answer questions 1 to 3. Good morning. Can I help you? Yes, good morning. We'd like to book a holiday for July, please. Certainly. Where did you have in mind? Oh, well, we haven't thought a lot about it, really. We'd just like to go somewhere hot, you know, and it must be in July. I see. Well, let's get the dates cleared up first, then we can see about availability. What part of July were you thinking of? Oh, well, you see, we have slightly different holidays. I've got the whole month except for the last five days, so I could go from the 1st to the 26th. But my friend here doesn't start until the 7th. So, I suppose it will have to be the middle two weeks, really. Yes, but I've got to be back before the 23rd. OK. Now, let's find a destination. Before you hear the rest of the conversation, you have some time to look at questions 4 to 10. Now listen and answer questions 4 to 10. Any preferences? France? Italy? Oh, not France. We went there last year and it was absolutely packed with teenagers, making noise and getting drunk all the time. Yes, it was terrible. We definitely want somewhere quieter this year. <laughs> well, of course, it depends more on the resort rather than the country. There are resorts in every country which cater for the family or the slightly older person. They're usually a shade more expensive, though, as you might expect. Oh, well, we don't mind paying a bit more if it means more peace and quiet, do we? Definitely not. It'll be well worth it. All right. Let's have a look at what we've got on the computer. July. Was it 10 or 14 nights you wanted? Oh, the fortnight, please. Right. Well, let's start with Italy. Um, we've got 14 nights, bed and breakfast, in Sorrento for £345 from Manchester on the 14th. Or we've got... No, wait a minute. That's no good for me. We wouldn't get back till the 28th. And I've got to be back at work before that. Ah, yes. Um, how about Sweden? Two weeks, half board. How much would that be? That would be £540, from Manchester again. Well, 540 uh, That seems too much. Well, madam, there's a surcharge for the airport, and it has a five-star hotel. Oh, well, it's a bit over our budget, really. All right. Let's try somewhere else. How about Portugal? Oh, that sounds great. We've never been there before, have we? Let's see now. We've got 14 nights in Albufeira, half board, from Gatwick, for £385. Albufeira? Oh, wait a minute. Did you say the flight was from London? That's right, from Gatwick. Oh, well, we'd prefer a flight from the north somewhere. Manchester, perhaps, or even Glasgow. That is the end of part one. You now have half a minute to check your answers.
Now turns to part two. Part two. Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? First, you have some time to look at questions 11 to 16. Now, listen carefully and answer questions 11 to 16. Over the past 50 years, there have been some radical changes in medicine, as it is known in the West. This is largely the result of vast improvements in technology, but also in the rising importance of alternative treatments. I have with me today Matthew East, a registered osteopath and a supporter of alternative techniques in healthcare. Matthew, can you tell us more about osteopathy? Well, perhaps the first thing I should say is that the term alternative is actually a little misleading, as I am referring to approaches and attitudes to health that were in common use long before Western medicine was established. I prefer the term natural. Anyway, I'll begin by telling you a little about osteopathy. Basically, osteopathy is the manipulation of muscles in order to alleviate stresses and tensions that lead to pain. Now, unlike Western medicine, osteopathy considers the whole body, not just the affected area. And this is a very important principle of natural remedies. The whole body must be considered before a course of treatment can be decided upon. You see, the aim of therapies like osteopathy is not only to repair the body, but also to get the body treating itself. And this does not come from treating the symptoms. To give an example, I recently treated a two-month-old baby who was screaming all day and was even worse at night. The couple had taken the baby to their doctor, but the only advice they were given was that the baby would grow out of it. However, the real problem stemmed from a difficult birth, which put pressure on the baby's neck. After 10 minutes of gentle manipulation, the pressure was released, and within 20 minutes the baby was quiet and calm for the first time. This was achieved without drugs or operations. Avoiding such invasive methods of treatment highlights another of the differences between Western medicine and a more natural approach. You see, Western medicine often uses surgery in order to find a solution to problems that could have been addressed with simple remedies. A medical approach that looks closely at how essential an operation is before it is performed would offer patients a considerably less stressful method of treatment, not to mention the financial savings. Natural remedies actually amount to about 10% of the cost of a Western course of treatment. Before you hear the rest of the talk, you have some time to look at questions 17 to 20. Now listen and answer questions 17 to 20. I'd like to mention the subject of surgery again a little later, but I would like to say at this point that there are those that claim that the benefits of osteopathy and herbal therapies are largely psychological, that they have not undergone the clinical trials that pharmaceuticals have. To answer that, you only need to look at the example I gave earlier of the baby that stopped crying less than an hour after treatment, but was obviously far too young to react because of purely psychological factors. Another example can be seen in the successful use of acupuncture in the treatment of animals. 
In response to criticism regarding clinical trials, it is worth noting that the power of pharmaceutical companies is such that, although some drugs fail the standards required of them, they are sometimes still prescribed by doctors. Moving on to another point, it should be stressed that natural remedies, in addition to having no side effects, can also be applied to any patient. Now, I'm not suggesting that the same treatments are used indiscriminately. Although natural remedies can be used with any age group, the treatment selected is very specific to the person. By this I mean that not only the general health of the patient needs to be considered, but also their habits, diet and lifestyle in order to build a complete picture. However, I am not suggesting that we should reject Western medicine entirely. In fact, there have been occasions when I have referred patients to their doctor, as I felt that in those cases it was the most suitable course of action. There are many situations in which it is by far the best option. Take emergency surgery, for example. Obviously, more natural remedies do not provide the speed required in such cases. The best solution would therefore be an open-minded combination of the two forms. Well, thank you very much, Matthew. That was a very interesting insight into alternative, sorry, natural treatments. Next week, we'll be inviting Dr. Moore. That's M-O-O-R-E onto the programme to argue his case as a doctor. Until next week, then, goodbye. That is the end of part two. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now turns to part three. Part three. You will hear two business studies students discussing a presentation they'll do on an article on working effectively in groups. First, you have some time to look at questions 21 to 26. Now listen and answer questions 21 to 26. So, Brad, what did you think of the article on group work? Oh, hi, Helen. Uh, yeah, it was pretty good, with helpful pieces of advice on how to make group work effective. I think we were lucky to be given such a straightforward text to present at the Management Skills Seminar. <laughs> yeah. Actually, shall we discuss it now? Have you got time? Sure. It's only a 10-minute presentation, so we just need to explain and then give our views on the main points raised in the article. I'll jot down some notes. Right. So, there are three main sections. I suggest we start with listening. Yeah, effective listening in groups, because it's not something that's frequently covered on courses in our field. No, and we should say that in the presentation. Yeah. And also, effective listening's pretty simple, you know. I don't think it's hard to learn. Well, people think it's easy, but in my experience, most of us tend to be very lazy listeners. OK, I wouldn't argue with that. <laughs> <laughs> Something I do think we should emphasize is the power of the listener's posture, gestures, etc., in making speakers feel respected. Not that you're just waiting for them to finish before jumping in with your own ideas. Uh-huh. OK, right. Uh, the next section is on goal setting. Let's make sure we're clear what the article says on this. Yeah. 
Well, firstly, it says that all group members must be given time to explain their own goals. That's it, yeah. And then, did it say that the whole group should agree on common goals? That's a bit too strong. It's more that everyone's agendas should be equally acceptable. But it does say that goals have to be realistic, you know... Achievable within a particular time? You've got it. That's really what the article's saying. There isn't really any point in having ideals if group members know they won't come to anything within a reasonable period. So, I think a summary covering those points will be enough for that part of the presentation, don't you? Yep. Now, the last section is about conflict resolution. Actually, I thought it was the worst part of the article. Me too. I don't think it went into sufficient detail on the issue. Actually, I thought it devoted too much space to it, but that it was all rather boring, you know? It didn't mention some of the more radical theories. Absolutely. I found that really irritating. Right. And also, I think it could have said more about conflict sometimes being healthy in groups. Absolutely. It just mentioned rather glibly about how we should avoid thinking of winners and losers and that quick resolution of conflict is always desirable. Without explaining what these terms mean? Well, it gives quite detailed definitions, but doesn't develop a proper argument. Right. So, for the presentation, I think we just give some definitions and... And then explain what we felt were the weaknesses in the article's treatment of conflict resolution. Yeah, good. Now you have some time to look at questions 27 to 30. Now listen and answer questions 27 to 30. So, let's think about what we have to prepare for the actual presentation. Well, I suppose we'll use PowerPoint, but I'm hopeless at using it, especially if it has any visuals. I really have to look into doing a course on it because I know I'll need it in the future. <laughs> Don't worry, I'm quite happy using PowerPoint and I'll put it together when everything else is ready. That's a relief. But yes, do that later. OK. Now, I heard the tutor saying we have to include some well-chosen quotations from the article. I'm not sure if we do. I'll email him to find out. No need. I can just have a look at the specs he gave us when he set the task. That'll be quicker. But the tutor definitely said we have to prepare a handout to go with the talk. I'm not really sure how we do that. Sarah did one last year. Who's she? She's doing the same option as me on marketing. I'll ask her advice on what to include. Great. So that just leaves the bibliography at the end. I suppose it'll mainly be articles. Yeah. So we'll just look on the web, and we can leave that till later. But we've been advised against that. Well, we could have a look through some journals in the library. I think we should start by looking through module handbooks. I think that'll give us some good leads. Yeah, you're probably right. So that's all the topics. That is the end of part three. You now have half a minute to check your answers. Now it turns to part four. Part four. Listen to the last part of the lecture. As you listen, complete the notes below. First, you have some time to look at questions 31 to 40.
Now listen carefully and answer questions 31 to 40. Last time I said that a lot of Irish people left the country and went to England, America and many other foreign countries. Today I'd like to talk about the emigration. The effects of immigration were not all bad. The immigrants experienced a lot of hardship in their new countries. There is a famous story about a park in Shanghai where Chinese and dogs were not allowed. Well, in England, until into the 1950s, signs for jobs sometimes read Irish need not apply. The immigrants often experienced discrimination, but they formed many organisations to look after their fellow emigrants. Many of these organisations later became very important. In America, the Irish chose politics as the way forward and significant cities were controlled by Irish politicians. This movement reached its peak with the election of John F. Kennedy in 1960. His grandparents came from Ireland and his election had a significant impact in Ireland, helping the process of recovery of self-confidence, which we have today. Today, there are 70 million people of Irish descent living outside Ireland. In America alone, there are 40 million people, and 10 million of these people have a 100% Irish background. They carried the culture of their home country with them and adapted it to their new home. They made changes which would be unthinkable in the home country, and we often laughed at the Yankees' Irishness. In fact, any immigrant who came back to live in Ireland, often after many years, found it very difficult to fit into Irish society again. They had been changed by the experience. These immigrants have always had an interest in the old country. The American letter was a letter containing dollars sent back to one's family. More recently, President Clinton has been very influential in bringing peace to the north of Ireland. Riverdance itself was the idea of a dancer who was American, who applied American methods to traditional dancing, and the fusion was immediately popular. Modern Ireland has been able to use the disaster of the last century to learn modern marketing techniques and apply them, without at the same time losing what is distinctive about itself. River dance is a demonstration of that distinctiveness. That is the end of part four. You now have half a minute to check your answers. That is the end of the test. You now have 10 minutes to transfer your answers to your IELTS listening answer sheet.